All right. So as we've noticed, you know, um, just real briefly, as we go through different books of the Bible, our Bible study, you know, some of them flow together more in like, like the chapter divisions. You know, obviously when the, when the Bible was written, when it was penned down, there wasn't chapter divisions. So this was something that was introduced, and I have no problems with chapter divisions, but in some books you kind of have real clear divisions of like from one thought and concept to another between chapters. So far what we've seen here though, this is really just flowing together. All the concepts are building up on each other. So um, if you haven't been here for the first four chapters, but um, I mean, hopefully you know, basically this is kind of a, a rebuke to the church at Corinth. There's a lot of problems that this church has been having. And we, we saw in the first couple chapters, you know, they were lifting people up one above another and saying, you know, I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos and I'm of Cephas and I'm of Christ, you know, and there's a lot of division within this church. You know, people are following their special guy and, and saying, well, I, you know, and they were really just kind of foolish with all of this. Instead of being united in the faith and united within their church in the faith, they were they're kind of forming these different factions. And um, we, we get into some more problems here. We're going we're gonna to start reading actually in chapter 4 to get back in context here of what he's saying in chapter 5. So we left off at the end of chapter 4. Look at verse number 18. The Bible says, Now some are puffed up as though I would not come to you. So like with their problems that they're having, they're, they're, they have this proud and lofty attitude. They're puffed up thinking like, well, he's not going to come here. And, and, you know, while the, the, the cat's away, the mice will play. And this is what was happening at the church of Corinth. You remember the Apostle Paul was the one going around with others, with other fellow laborers, and getting these people saved and helping these churches to get established in all of these different areas. So he's going out and doing his missionary work in all these different areas. And, you know, he's getting word back about these people in Corinth and this church that's going on and all these problems. So he's writing back to them and he's saying, now, look, I know some of you guys are puffed up as though I'm not going to come back. But look at verse 19, it says, But I will come to you shortly if the Lord will, and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod, or in love, and in the spirit of meekness? And he's saying, look, the choice is yours. You guys need to straighten this stuff up so when I get back there, I don't just have to come and basically lay down the law and give a beating to the church. Now, obviously, he's not talking about like physically just, just whacking them with the rod. But, you know, he doesn't want to have to go there and just preach and just rip their faces off. He's like, do I have to really set things straight and just come in and be the bad guy? He's like, get your, get your act together so I don't have to do this so I can come and love. And then he, but he continues on here. Look at verse number one. And, and this is the reason, one of the main reasons why he's telling them, hey, should, am I going to come with the rod or am I going to come in love? It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. So he's saying not only is there fornication, I mean, fornication is a very serious sin. And, and we live in such a permissive society today where it's just pretty much expected of our kids. Oh, well, they're just going to fornicate. Because that's just what they're going to do. And, and we have this culture where, you know, I remember it started even in, in, in my generation with the, the whole handing out um, um, prophylactics or birth control methods in the schools. And that was a new thing when I was in the 90s. That was a much newer thing where kids were getting access to this stuff within the schools. And that was kind of a big debate at that time. Now it's like they're introducing just education on, on, on these, these bedroom matters at such a young age and indoctrinating these kids that basically, you know, when the belief is that you're an animal, they're going to teach the kids that, well, you're just going to act like an animal and they try to get the parents to accept, well, that's how they're going to act. That they're just going to go off and act on all these impulses. Now, does fornication happen? Yes, I'm not, I'm not an idiot and I'm not blind. It does happen. But we don't need to be taking the approach of just saying, well, you know, you're going to do it anyway, so here you go. I'm going to, I'm going to help you to minimize your risk. No. When something's wrong, it's wrong. And if you're going to take those chances, you just you're gonna have to deal with it. I mean, you, you have to reap what you sow. And, you know, you may say, oh, that's hard-hearted. But we need to, to establish what is right and what is wrong. The kids need to know and to hear, this is wrong. And you can't be doing this. And I will in no way, shape, or form condone of it at all. I'm not going to help you along and say, well, here you go. Here, here's something to help you commit sin. 
Not going to happen. And that's the wrong message that we're sending to the kids when we start doing those types of things. But if the fornication wasn't bad enough, this is what was going on in this church. And this is what was acceptable and accepted in this church. He says, it's not just your average fornication. He said, this is fornication that's not even named among the Gentiles. You know, the heathen, they don't even talk about this stuff that a man should have his, his father's wife. Now, that's really bad. Now, I don't think that this is like that his dad is still married to this woman about having his mother. You know, that, that's, I mean, that would be adultery anyways. But I think this is like, you know, his dad's either divorced or has passed away. Either way, though, this is extremely wicked sin. And I want you to turn, if you would, to Leviticus chapter 20. We're going to see what the law thinks about this. We live in a perverted world today. It really is sick and twisted, and, and so many things are changing and becoming more and more and more acceptable through the brainwashing of the media, through the music, through the television, through the movies, and, and you get inundate, inundated with these images of, of people committing sin, and at first, it's shocking when you see it. You know, they always try to, to shock you, and, and they've been doing these, these pushes and these slow pushes. The agenda has been to, to get us more and more wicked as a society and to accept more and more filth as being normal. I mean, you think about, you think about television, you know, 40 years ago, 50 years, you have to leave it to Beaver and all these other shows on there that were relatively wholesome, but even those shows for the time, they would introduce things that were a little bit more shocking at that time. It was a little bit abnormal. If you think about The Odd Couple, right? That was an old show back in the you know, 70s or whatever. What was it? Two guys living together. Why was, it, why was it such a big deal? Because it was really weird for two guys to be living together in that time frame. Because you just don't do that. I mean, the, the, the morality and, and the thinking was... A more, much more close to the biblical model of the children are brought up in the home and they leave the home when they get married. You know, for this reason shall man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. That's what the Bible teaches. And, and this was before the whole concept of, you know, kids turning 18 and just going out and living with roommates and, you know, and doing all this other stuff that has become completely normal and acceptable and even expected these days. That, that kids are growing up and just expecting, well, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm 18, I'm going to go and leave the house, I'm going to go work, I'm just going to go do my own thing and not have a wife. They're going to sow their wild oats, they're getting in all kinds of trouble because they don't have anyone, any, any authority structure, they have nobody to be responsible to or responsible for, or to, be, to be accountable to. And this is the way that, that we're going. But look at, you're in Leviticus chapter 20. Because as our society gets more wicked, these, these extremely weird, perverted, wicked sins become less shocking. Paul was shocked. He's like, you guys have someone in your church that's committing fornication. That's not even named among the Gentiles. And you think it's just fine. You're puffed up and you think that this is just great. And nobody's dealing with the issue. Because you're so loving. And we'll get into that in just a minute. But Leviticus 20 is a chapter. It's not a fun chapter to read. It's, a, it's not like I love turning here and reading all these scriptures. But it, it shows you how God feels about all these various sins. Let's start reading here in verse number 10. The Bible says, And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. And I've mentioned, I mention this frequently in my sermons because it needs to be brought up over and over and over again on our view of adultery. We live in an adulterous generation. We live in a generation where people are getting divorced at a percentage rate of over 50%, over half the marriages. And I don't even know what it is anymore because it just keeps on going up. Over, well over half the marriages in America are ending in divorce. And a big reason for that is adultery. And once they do this, they're causing their, their, their ex-spouse to commit adultery because, you know, again, the, the Jesus Christ, I'm not, I'm not even getting all that tonight. I've got way too much stuff to get into tonight. But we see here that God's law and in his commandments is that if, if, if a man and woman commit adultery, they both need to be put to death. I mean, there is nothing more severe in God's law than the death penalty. That's it. I mean, you've just committed basically the worst sin that you can do. And any of these things where God's saying, you know what, you, need to, you deserve to die. Your life is just completely being removed from you. That's how serious adultery is. And when you have a, a sin with this type of consequence on it, if we actually had these laws in place that, that God ordained, 
I guarantee you there would be a lot less adultery. I mean, adultery is one thing. Yes, it's a lust of the flesh, but we, you can control that. Especially when you think, you know what, I'm going to lose my life over this. It's, it's just not worth it. It's just not worth it. And people have a lot of problems with sin, and I get it. Believe me, I'm a, I'm a human being too, and I have flesh, and I have desires. But when you have consequences like this, you got to realize, one, okay, God's taking is pretty serious. And as you get caught up just thinking about yourself and your feelings towards someone else and your own lusts, it's so selfish. You, you forget about the trust and your family and your spouse or anyone else that you're affecting and actually harming extremely when you commit that sin of adultery, which is why God said, you know, you're hurting other people so bad here that you're just going to lose your life over it. Just as much as the murderer that takes someone else's life, they need to be put to death. The adulterer and the adulteress get put to death. So you say, well, I'm not even married. Yeah, but if you go around sleeping with, with someone's husband or sleeping with someone's wife, it doesn't matter if you're married or not. You're still committing adultery and you're just as much guilty as the person who's married and you deserve the same punishment as them. But let's keep reading here because we start off in, in verse 10 where we're reading with adultery getting the death penalty. But look at verse number 11. It says, And the man that lieth with his father's wife. This is exactly what we have in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Now earlier in the sermon I mentioned that I don't think that this man who's, who's committing a, or who is fornicating with his, mother's, with his father's wife I don't think that they're still married because it's the same wording as we see here. And he, if he just got done telling you that the, that the punishment for adultery is a death penalty, if they were still married, that's still adultery. So it's still like fall under that same category, if you, you know what I'm saying. Like there'd be no reason to add all these other things underneath that of having your father's wife if he's talking about people who are still married. He's just saying, look, once people come together, it's like, it's like when someone is, is divorced, right? He says, if two people are married and the marriage is consummated, God says not to get divorced. But if you do get divorced, you can still reconcile that marriage, but only on the grounds that neither, neither spouse has been married to somebody else because once that happened, you know, the person's defiled or polluted and you can't go back to that again. So with keeping that, that concept in mind, you know, when you have a woman and a man, that's your father. And even if it's your mother or your stepmother, right, he, mar he gets widowed maybe, marries someone else. Once they've come together, like as a child of your father, you can't go in unto that person, unto that woman. That, and that's bizarre and sick and twisted. And, and it's weird, like it's too bad that we even have to have this spelled out for us. That that is just immoral and wicked. And this is so bad. The Bible says in verse 11, And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon him. Again, another sin worthy of the death penalty. Now, fornication is not worthy of the death penalty. The Bible does not have a punishment on fornication that is just, yeah, they're gonna, you're, you're going to be stoned to death because you've committed fornication. Adultery, yes. And this type of fornication, lying with your father's wife, yes, that's a death penalty also. So when the Apostle Paul is bringing up in the church, you guys have somebody in your church that's, that's committing fornication, but it's not just any fornication. I mean, it, it's something that's so bad that he would deserve to die under God's law. Now, they're under Roman law. I get it. But he's saying this is, this is a big deal and you can't just accept this and accept all this filth and we'll get into why in a minute but I want to keep reading here because there's a few more verses here in Leviticus chapter 20 I want to just make sure we get through. Verse number 12 says, And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion. Their blood shall be upon them. So it works both ways for the father and a daughter-in-law or for a son with his mother or with his stepmother or whoever. Uh, verse 13, if a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man take a wife and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burnt with fire, both he and they, that there be no wickedness among you. 
These are some serious sins. And these are sins, mark my words, these are, these are sins in this strange world that are starting to become more and more accepted. We see it with the sodomy. I mean, we see it with them marching up and down and holding parades and people just putting up with it saying, this is okay. We see it getting crammed down your throat on the television and in the movies and just trying to get you accepted. It's just an alternative lifestyle. Everything's just fine. When God says they deserve to die, because it's such, it's so abominable and wicked and perverted that there's just no hope for that. You just need to put them to death. But society is going to try to tell you, no, everything's just fine. And you know what? This church, you know, we live in a strange world. I keep on getting ahead of myself. There's nothing new under the sun. Nothing new. This, I mean, this is thousands of years ago in God's law. He's telling them about this stuff. We have the same things happening today, the same sins that people could commit. We got sodomy today. Well, they had it back then, and God ordained this punishment. But these things will become much more common the more depraved our society becomes. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, you know, with, with, with friends, you know, razzing people. You call them, oh, you fag or whatever. And, and nobody, nobody batted an eye at it back then. It was no big deal to mock or make fun of someone and say, what are you, a fag? But these days you say the word fag and everyone, oh, I can't believe you said that. Oh, you're going to be offending people. Look, they're faggots. They're, nat they're, they're, they're like natural brute beasts made to be destroyed. According to the Bible, read Jude. Read 2 Peter chapter 2. Read about the people who are reprobate concerning the faith. Read Romans chapter 1. Okay, people who are given over to that filth. They have no hope, and it needs to be called out for what it is. And you know what? All the sin needs to be called out for what it is. It's not just the homos. It's, it's the, you know, the adultery. It's, the, it's every other sin here. I mean, we talk about the death penalty. This is serious. It all needs to be put in the proper light and rejected and not accepted. And we're not going to have some big sign say, well, everybody welcome in this church because everyone's not welcome in this church. We are going to have... A, a biblical church here according to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 of people we're going to have nothing to do with. Now we're going to go out and try to get people saved. But the church is an assembly of believers in Christ. It's for people who are already saved to come in and fellowship and, and congregate together with. And the Apostle Paul lays out some rules here of look, there's certain things that you just need to stay away from and you need to break fellowship with them and get them out of your company. And we're going to get into that in just a minute. I'm, I'm bouncing around just a little bit. I got into this point, uh, but it's fine. We, you know, it, it all needs to be um, handled here. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. After seeing Leviticus chapter 20, and these people should know that Mosaic law. They should know. I mean, it's pretty basic stuff. And even if they didn't know the law, they should know that that's, that's pretty weird to have your father's wife and to commit that fornication, that, that's just, that, naturally, that's just kind of a, turns your stomach a little bit. It's just really weird. But look at what he says in verse number 2 of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, And ye are puffed up, and if not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. He says, look, you guys should be sad and sorry. I can't believe that this person is doing this in our church. And instead, they're just puffed up and just, just open with it. Like, it's no big deal. We're fine. You know, it, when you see this puffed up, you think about people who like the sodomites who get, who get lifted up in their pride and, and they, they revel in their own shame. You know, the things that ought to be, be shameful and, and you should never want to have exposed to the public. Some people glory in their shame. They just look at it like it's no big deal and they just display it out for the world. And it's disgusting. And he's kind of rebuking this church for saying, you know, this is extremely wicked sin. You should be ashamed of this. You shouldn't be puffed up and be like, yep, that's what we got in our church. Pride is a big problem that the church at Corinth had from the pride of lifting up one person above another and comparing themselves against each other and this is overall attitude of, of the Apostle Paul, well, he's not going to come and he's not going to do anything and you know, the things that he says, you know, they seem real powerful when he writes to us, but when he gets here, we know he's not going to do anything. It's all just a bunch of words and a bunch of talk. This is the, the, the attitude that the church at Corinth had. It's a bad attitude to have. Instead of, instead of treating what Paul was saying to, uh, to them as you know, being humble and receiving the word of God, 
they were just kind of just letting whatever happen within the walls of their church. But let's keep reading here. Verse number three. He says, For I verily, as absent in body but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. Puzzle Paul saying, Look, I don't even have to be there. I don't have to know what all the details are. I don't care about their feelings toward each other. You know, there's, there's nothing that you're going to tell me that's going to change my judgment. And this is like, I've judged already. It's wickedness. It's sin. And this needs to be out of the church. You need to deal with this now. I don't need to hear all the sides of the story. He said, this is wickedness and this is sin. And this is the way we need to deal with this. And unfortunately, especially with the things with adultery and fornication, you know, the TV is brainwashing you into thinking that, Oh, well, you know, to sympathizing and empathizing with people. Oh, well, you know, my wife wasn't really paying enough attention to me. And I'm talking to this other lady at work, you know, and we just got real close friends. And then one thing led to another, you know, so that people could think, oh, oh, yeah, oh, I could see how they got, you know, and, and you start sympathizing with people to the point to where, yeah, well, we're all sinners, right? I mean, you commit adultery, but I guess we're all sinners. Instead of saying, you know what, that's a wicked sin. That's worthy of the death penalty. I can't believe that you did that. And ostracizing that instead of, instead of just accepting that and saying, oh, okay, everything's fine. And what, the, what the, the media will try to do is to make it think like all of you are so close to just committing these horrible sins. And the more they normalize you to that, to that behavior, the easier it will be to commit those sins. You're thinking, oh, well, this is, this is what happens. I mean, this happens all the time. If you see something on TV, you make it, it makes you think that these things happen all the time, when it, oftentimes it doesn't at all. I mean, it's a tell-lie vision. It tells you lies. There, nothing on TV is real. I mean, everything is staged. Everything has all these different acts and stuff. They try to get it just right, and they're tr trying to present something to you and make it believable. And just because you see it on TV doesn't make it real. And just because you think it looks like all these different characters are doing all these, getting all these different sins, but yet they're living these great lives, it's not reality. Verse number four, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is Paul's judgment to that person. Verse number five, to deliver such an one unto Satan. For the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He said, this is the judgment that needs to be passed on this person that's in your church. He says, give him up to Satan. Now, can you imagine going into church these days and, and hearing a pastor say, like, well, yeah, this person needs to be given over to Satan. People would think you're nuts. But this is what the apostle Paul was saying to the church at Corinth. He said, give him up to Satan. We can't give anyone up to Satan. There are some people you need to give up to Satan or else, or else this just isn't true. Maybe the Apostle Paul wasn't speaking the word of God. Maybe we should just, just, just rip 1 Corinthians chapter 5 out of our Bibles. No. There's a love. See, we do need to be loving as a church, but we also need to understand what love is and have a proper, a proper definition of love. See, sometimes people need to have Tough love. Sometimes in order to get right, you need to be told that you're wrong and you need to have consequences come upon you. If I just... Think about this now. Think about this with your own children. With my children. If every time they did something wrong, I just gave them a hug. I mean, every time I just... I give them a kiss. I give them a hug. <laughs> Honey, what are you doing? I mean, just give them a hug, right? They're gonna, they'll be just fine. Just, just give them a kiss. Give them a, just, just love it out of them. You think they're going to grow up and learn to respect you and to listen to what you have to say and to just do it, you know, to, to be good children and, and be obedient children? Of course not. You have to have discipline. You have to have consequences for your action. That's why the Bible talks about spanking your children as, as you know, the rod gives, gives reproof and correction and it gives wisdom. They're going to understand, oh, I can't just do whatever I want because there's actually consequences when I break the rules, when I do things that, are, that I'm told not to do by the authority in my life. And when you're a child, the authority in your life is your parents, but it teaches you a greater understanding that there is authority in all of our lives that is God the Father. He is the authority in our life. And when we sin and break his commandments and his laws, there is a consequence, and that consequence is hell. 
Having consequences for actions is a good thing. Inherently, it's a great thing. And Paul's saying, look, in the church, you can't just be so open arms, lovey-dovey. When people are committing sins like this, you need to just deliver them unto Satan. He says, yeah, maybe his flesh will be destroyed, but maybe that'll cause his spirit to get saved. He said, you know what? That person might need, you know, and oftentimes, People get so lifted up with pride in this world. They work, they build their own business, they do things all on their own, and they feel like they don't need anything from anybody. So they think, what do I need from God? I've got a great house, I've got a great family, I've got all, you know, all these toys and all these things, and I'm comfortable, I'm not hungry, everything's going great, and what do I need God for? I don't even think there is a God. But people like that, when they get brought down real low, when there's a destruction of the flesh, so to speak, and, and maybe they lose everything, and they start losing their health, all of a sudden they're turning to God. And praise God for that. You know what? If that's what it takes for people to get, pray, get saved, I pray that that happens to everybody if that's going to get them to be saved. Who cares about the stinking money and the, and the wealth? And I actually, there's people that I pray for that that will happen to because I feel like they're just way too lifted up in their pride to receive Christ as their Savior right now. And I think that is a stumbling block for them. Yes, I pray for the financial demise of people, not because I hate them and I want to see them suffer, but rather because I want their heart to be broken and to turn to Christ for, as their Savior. And it's the same way. You know, Paul has the love for this guy. He does want this guy to be saved, but at the same time, he has a love for everybody else in that congregation also. Let's keep reading here. Look at verse number 6. The Bible says, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? He's saying, don't you know? I mean, it just takes a little bit, and it's going to spread. So when you have somebody like this, and he's committing this type of open sin in the congregation... Other people are going to look on that, and they're going to learn from that. They're going to say, oh, wow. Well, if this guy's getting away with this, I get, well, my sin's not that bad. I'm going to come out, and people are start becoming more open with this stuff and, and committing worse and worse sins. And I mean, why wouldn't you, right? There's, there's no consequences. He said, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. That's why we need to be careful who we decide to spend our time with also. You know, as a Christian, as a believer, you, know, you, you don't want to have your best friend, you'll be yoked up with someone who's an unbeliever. You know, the Bible says, you know, what concord hath Christ with Belial? You know, what, what fellowship has um, light with darkness? You know, it, I, I'm not saying you can't, like, speak to somebody or have someone you call a friend that's not saved. I mean, obviously, you want to reach those people and love them and, and try to get to them, but they shouldn't be, like, your best friend that you're just constantly spending all of your time with, and they're not even saved. Because that leaven is going to rub off on you. As much as you might think you're going to be able to, to bring them up and get them saved, it's not going to work like that. They're going to drag you down. And look at what he says here. He says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, verse number 7, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And he's speaking unto the church. That's where he says, purge out the old leaven. Purge that out from among you in the congregation. Get that out of here that ye, speaking plurally to everybody, that you might be a new lump, that all of you might be able to come together, not with that old leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Too many churches these days are not operating according to the biblical principles on how a church needs to be run. I mean, whether it's the qualifications for, for a bishop or a pastor, as laid out in the Bible, or when it talks about you know, being the husband of one wife, you know, not a novice, that um, they need to be um, ruling their, their families and, and their household well, and all, you know, all the different qualifications... But also in this regard, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, look at what it says in verse number 9. Because we need to, the church ought to be separate from the world. Verse number 9 says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. And he's going to explain this a little bit before. He says, I already wrote to you guys, you know, don't be hanging around with fornicators. 
You shouldn't just be buddy-buddy with a bunch of fornicators, right? You shouldn't just be, be doing this whatever. But he's going to clarify that statement. He says, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. So he's saying like, I'm not saying you can't have any contact with anybody who is any of these things because they're all over in the world. The world is full of the idolater. It's full of the extortioner. It's full of the fornicator. It's full of these things. So you, then you just have to basically pack up and, and you know, join a commune somewhere and isolate yourself from the whole world in order, in order to be right. But he's like saying, no, that's, that's not the case. And you know what? There are people, there's Baptist churches that decide to go out in the middle of nowhere and just be really rural and just, just seclude themselves. And, you know, I worry about those places of being cults. Because that is so far against what Jesus Christ taught for us to do and what the Bible teaches. Look, we need to be going out and preaching the gospel of every creature, not just holing up and, 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 and not shining that light in this dark world. We need to be reaching as many people as possible, not just keeping to ourselves and, and staying in, in that little, little tiny sheltered um, you know, group where you're not going to go out and do anything for God. He says in verse number 11, But now I have written unto you, not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one know not to eat. So I don't even want you going out and having lunch with these guys if they're called a brother. And that's the key there. He says, anyone that's called a brother. Now look, in church, what are we trying to do? We, well, when we're in church, we're learning, we're hearing from the, the, the Word of God, we're singing praises unto God's name, and we're edifying one another, we're caring for each other, and, and, and looking out for each other within the church. The church is literally a family of believers, brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what the church is for. But what do we do, though? I mean, we want the church to grow. How does the church grow? We go out... We preach the gospel to people. We try to convert them to believing on Christ. And then we say, hey, come to church with us. You could learn and you could grow some more. You could, you know, you'll hear some more truth from the Bible. Come on in. So these people, as they come in, especially new converts, they'll probably have a lot more sin in their life than the brother who's been here for you know, 10 years or whatever, you know, who's been saved for a long time and has, has been coming to church faithfully and, and has been doing a good job of you know, cleaning up their life. There are going to be people that come in, but see, if you notice, like if you go to the church for a while, you notice some people like Brother So, we've got Brother Sebastian here, right? He's been coming for a while, he's faithful. We, he's known as Brother Sebastian, right? But... Just because someone comes in, you know, what I'm saying is that people need time to grow. So if someone just gets saved today, like we just went out soul winning and got a kid saved, if he like came to church tonight, oh, you're not going to say, oh, well, you're, you, oh, you have a girlfriend and you're fornicating, get out of here. You know, it's not the way it operates. He says, you know, if someone's called a brother, right, someone who, someone who knows better, right, someone who's learned. Now, there does come a point in growth that you have to say, okay, I mean, you're continuing to do this stuff. The Bible says that I'm not even supposed to eat with you, so you've heard it. You know, you should know by now. You've seen it in the Scripture. Because a lot of people don't even know these things. I know my wife is really ignorant of the Bible when she got saved. I mean, she grew up in, in a completely just a religious, just no religious background at all and didn't know anything about Scripture. She didn't know it was wrong to drink. She didn't know it was wrong to do a lot of things, you know, fornicate, all these things. She didn't even know it. She didn't know. So if she, when she got saved, if she were to, you know, you can't just kick her out for, for not even knowing. But once you hear, once you know, once you start growing, you know, there comes a point where you're saying, okay, look, you, you, you gotta you gotta repent. You gotta change. You you've got to um, because those because those are serious sins. And look at all the sins that he mentions here in verse number eleven. He says a fornicator. Fornicator is a serious sin, and these are all serious sins. So whether or not you think they are, because they're in this list where he's saying I don't even want you eating with these people, it makes it serious. Because the next one, covetous. Covetous. And this is something that most people don't even realize is a sin. 
we live in such a commercialized society. You, you got you got these these TV, you know, the, the TV commercials and the ads. Every I mean, you drive, you got billboards. Everything is trying to sell you on something that you don't have, and telling you why you need this so bad, and trying to put things in front of your face to make you want things that you don't have, that don't belong to you, and in many cases you can't even afford. That covetousness and that attitude, that's a sin. And when someone has this type of an attitude of just wanting things, wanting things that don't belong to you, this always leads to other things. The Bible says that you know, the love of money is the root of all evil. But what is the love of money? It's a covetous thing. It's you, you love money. You want to get more and more of that. And that leads to every other kind of sin. All sin. Can, can be rooted in that, in that love of money. And when you want these things and desire things that don't belong to you, desire a, a, a person that doesn't belong to you, and commit adultery, right? You want, you want anything. That's covetous. And when people have, they're just, they're just filled with covetous, they have a covetous attitude, you know, that's going to rub off on you. And he's saying, this is that leaven that you don't want to leaven the whole lump. And, and you know, when people are, are really covetous, you need to get them out of, out of, the, out of the church. Or an idolater, right? People are putting up idols. People are you know, obviously uh, worshiping false gods. A railer. People just, just, just rails on other people and, um, you know, rips them down. And um, oftentimes a railer is someone that's associated with someone who's kind of bearing false witness against people too, especially that are just kind of lying about people and railing on people and bringing them down. You know, that's, that's the exact opposite of what we come here for in church is supposed to be for edification, right? You're not here just to rip people down. Now, uh, every once in a while people need a rebuke, but you can do so tactfully and in a loving way where you're not just railing on somebody. But no, normally, I mean, you could look up the word for yourself in the Bible. Normally, like railers is also highly associated with people who are falsely accusing and saying things that just aren't true when they're speaking bad about somebody. Um, a drunkard, you know, people who are, who are going out and drinking regularly, that's, that is not, should not be allowed in the church. Or an extortioner, right? You're holding something over someone's head uh, for, and extorting them. All these sins are very serious sins. And the Bible says, when you got someone that's called a brother and they're coming to church and, and, and one of these things, like that describes them, they need to be kicked out of the church. They're out. And that is how this church operates and will operate as long as I'm the pastor here. Is that someone's called a brother and I find out, I mean, you, you know, you can't, you know, it's not like I'm going to be just patrolling and policing and they're like following you home and be like, what does this person do with their time? But if it's just open, I mean, and if I find out, I mean, like, yeah, this guy's, this guy's going out to the bar every week. We see him. He's just getting drunk. I mean, he's, he's every, every weekend he's going out and getting hammered. The guy's a drunkard, okay? And he's not going to be allowed in this church until he repents. Now, let's finish up the chapter here. Look at verse number 12. Paul says, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without. Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So he's saying, look, I'm not here to judge people outside of the church, right? We have this, room, we have this church here that's supposed to be sanctified, it's supposed to be set apart, it's supposed to be a holy. It's supposed to be different than the world. We're supposed to be setting the example. Look, he says, God's going to judge the unbelievers. God's going to judge the people outside of the church. We don't have to worry about that. But he says, do not ye judge them that are within. I mean, shouldn't you be at least judging what's going on in the church? You know, when people say, oh, don't judge, don't judge, you know, judge not, and don't read the whole rest of the chapter and tell you you can't judge anything. Well, he's telling us right here, don't you judge people within the church? I mean, this is what we're supposed to be doing. He's saying, look, these sins, when people are, are involved with this and they're a fornicator or an extortioner or a railer or a drunkard, they're not allowed in here. I'm not even going to eat with you. Oh, you just think you're so much better than everyone else. No, it's because I don't want that rubbing off on me. It's not because I just feel like I'm holier than now. But look, these sins, you know, for someone to say you're holier, than, it's, it's, it's ridiculous these days. People are trying to say, oh, well, who do you think you are when you're like preaching against the sodomites? It's like, I'm not even close to being a sodomite. I mean, that is so far low and depraved and wicked and weird and gross. Like, oh, you're just holier than now. No. 
I recognize that we're all sinners. I, I do. And, and, and I admit that. And I will admit to your face any day of the week that I am a sinner. I am guilty of many sins and I sin every day. But God puts differences of sins in different categories. He has different judgments associated with different sins. For example, adultery and sodomy and, you know, taking your father's wife are all worthy of death. Those are more grievous sins than fornicating even. Now, fornication is still a serious sin, but it didn't have the death penalty. It's more, it's, those are more grievous than telling a lie, even than stealing. I mean, stealing is a bad sin, right? It's one of the Ten Commandments. But the Bible doesn't put the death penalty on that. He says, okay, you got to repay, you know, fourfold or fivefold or what, you know, depending on what it was. There's all the rules are laid out. He says, you're going to have to restore and, and, and give above and beyond that for, for the, you know, for the inconvenience of them having it stolen and everything else. There's justice and there's judgment. So we ought to be examples where we are not just a church full of people that are committing like the worst of the worst sins and that we actually don't even allow that in the church because you need to be able to bring yourself up to some level of, of honoring God and respecting his word to be able to, um, to, to be in the congregation in good standing here. So yes, you will find judgment at this church, and it's a proper biblical judgment. Though, See, we're also not going to go and start judging people and casting people out for sins that aren't listed in this list. I mean, if people are doing other things, you know, I've heard, you know, it's, it, I've actually wondered this in the past too. You know, what about someone who's divorced, and they're in church, and there's another person that's in church, but then they decide to go and get married, right? I mean, they're just blatantly just disregarding God's word, are you going to kick them out of the church? Well, is that found in this list here? Because it's not. Now, is it a sin? Yes, it is. And if that ever happens in this church, you better believe I'm going to, I'm going to preach on it and preach hard on it so that there is no doubt in the congregation of where we stand. So that they're not, because they're, you know, the, the problem with that is, and this is the thinking, well, if they just openly do that, right, it's going gonna, it's gonna to maybe entice other people to do the same thing and say, oh, well, everything's fine. That's why we're going to preach hard against it, but it is still not a sin that is going to get you thrown out of the church for doing that. Because then where do you draw the line? I mean, there's other people that could come to church that have already, that's already happened, and then they start coming to church, and you say, well, you're not allowed here because you've already been divorced and you're remarried? No. And there's other sins that people can do even openly. But if they're not in this list, now you better bet if it's being done, I'm going to preach against it. And you're going to hear about it. Why? Because I love that person. They need to get right with God. And the people in the congregation need to know that this isn't acceptable. You know, this is a sin. It needs to be corrected. But if it's not on this list, you know, that, that, that's, they're not going to get kicked out. They're not going to get thrown out of the church because that's not, um, you know, right. We're a judge of righteous judgment. Now, one last thing I want to point out here. Turn if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We're done with 1 Corinthians 5. Turn if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. While we do have these rules in place, so to speak, where, where we're going to obey the, the biblical model here of some people just need to not be allowed to, to congregate here. Someone is called a brother because they're in these grievous sins. If that person repents, if that person gets right with God, yes, they are allowed back in. It's not this permanent banishment and expulsion from the church. Because the whole point is that, you know, these people, you don't want a little leaven to leaven the whole lump. You don't want to bring that sin and just make it acceptable. You have to draw a line somewhere and just say, okay, you know what? You, you just need to be turned over to Satan. Because you're, you are lifted up with so much pride that you're not getting right with God. You're not respecting God at all. And, and, you know, maybe you just need to be brought really low with the destruction of your flesh. But it's not going to happen here. You need, you need to just, just take your, your sin and get out of here with, with, you know, these things that are so wicked. That is out of love. I was saying a tough love that that person needs that. You can't just be thinking everything's fine and uh, there's no problems. When, um, when you're doing something so bad. But then also, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2 because 
Paul addresses this now. He's, remember, this is the first epistle to the Corinthians. He's saying, these are your problems. You need to get this fixed. You know, there's this guy in your church that's committing this, this wicked abomination, and you guys need to, get, you need to deal with this. You need to get rid of it. But now he deals with this again in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 because he's writing back to them again. Look at verse number 1. He says, But I determined this with, with myself, that I would, come, I would not come again to you in heaviness. For if I make you sorry... Who is he then that maketh me glad, but the same which is made sorry by me? He's saying, look, if, if I make you sorry, if I make you sad about things, you know, he's basically, who's going to make me glad? It's you guys are the ones that are making me glad. You know, uh, so verse number three says, And I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you, and with many tears, not that ye should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. So he's saying, you know, when I wrote unto you, it wasn't, it wasn't really to make you just grieved and sorrowful. He says, but that you might know that I actually love you. Because a, a true friend, someone who really cares about you and loves you, is going to be able to tell you the truth. I brought that up on Sunday. You know, if there's something that just, just it's, it's like the people that love the, the lost that try to get them saved. You, know, you use the analogy of if there's someone's in the house and you know they're in there and their house is burning down, it's on fire, you're not going to call them up and be like, hey, buddy, you know, everything's going great. I just want to tell you how much I love you and you're a good friend of mine. If you really love them, you're going to warn them and say, hey, look, your house is burning down. You know, get out of there as fast as you can. And the people that love the lost are the ones that are bringing them the gospel, right? You're going to try to tell them, hey, I, I don't want you to go to hell. Jesus Christ paid for all of your sins, and all you got to do is put your faith on him, and you'll be saved, and you're saved forever. It's great news. But the person who's doing that is the one who really loves those people. It's not the person who refuses to ever talk about religion because they don't want to offend them. And then that person dies and goes to hell. That's not love. And you know what? Christian churches are filled with people who are afraid and ashamed of the gospel and will not open up their mouths because they don't want to offend people. And the people are dying and going to hell. The person that loves them is going to tell them the truth. And also, the person that loves a, a brother in Christ, when they're in these open sins and they need to be rebuked and it needs to be dealt with, the, the loving friend, the loving brother is going to, is going to say, hey man, you know, you, this seems to be a problem. And, you know, the Bible's saying this, to, to help them out. And in extreme cases, when they're just, they just won't hear it, or they're committing these other sins, they need to just be put out of the company until they can get right with God. So this is what he's explaining to them here about, you know, he's, he's riding with them with tears. You know, it, it grieves him to be, even have to write this stuff to him. He says, look at verse number five. But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many, so that contrarywise ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. So once you, you know, once you dole out the proper punishment that's associated, you know, that, okay, I can't even eat with you anymore. And they realize, wow, like I'm, I'm shunned, you know, like, like this, is, this is a big deal. I, maybe I should, I should do something about this. And then they get right with God and they repent and they're sorry. Then you need to be able to forgive them. We need to be able to welcome them back with open arms and say, come on in. And you don't have to bring up the past to them ever again. Forgive and forget the same way that God does. You know, when you're forgiven of your sins, God is never going to mention them to you again. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he separated us from our sins. So when you can forgive somebody else, when they've wronged you, even if they've wronged you, maybe you're one of the ones that they were extorting, if they're an extortioner, right? Maybe you are the one that they were railing on. We need to be able to forgive. If they get right with God, we need to be able to just welcome them back, have the forgiveness of Christ, and say, welcome back, brother. Glad that you're here. Glad that you, you're, you're doing the right thing, and you don't even have to mention what was done in the past. So... As, as hard as it may be, you know, hard preaching, hard, hard on the sin and, and say, oh man, this is such a, you know, I, I don't know about this church. You know, it's so difficult. You guys actually going to throw people out of your church? You're a small church. Why would you throw anyone out of here? You know, there's hardly anybody here. What do you mean you're going to throw people out? Well, 
Thankfully, we don't have that problem. But you know what? I'm more, I'm more concerned with doing things according to the Bible and according to God's Word than I am with just bringing in a bunch of people. It's not about, my job is not about just filling up this place with as many people as I get packed in here and, and feel like that's a success. No, my job is to preach God's word in season, out of, se out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And that's what I'm trying to do to the best of my ability. So, yeah, we will kick people out when it's necessary. And yes, I wish more churches would follow the biblical example and the biblical models on how the church ought to operate and be run because honestly, there would be a lot less problems in the churches when you don't have the, 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 the tail bearers that are like the, the, the revilers, the people who are, who are um, railing on people and causing these divisions and these factions. And then you won't have the, the homos and the predators that are preying on your kids when you don't allow them into the church. Look, I love your kids more than I love the homo. You got that? You better believe that. Because I don't want any children to be defiled. That's why they're not going to be allowed here. And yes, it's basically the same thing. A pedophile and a homo are, are basically one and the same. They're predators. They prey on people. And, and that is why you say, oh, because you know, people don't get this. People don't get this concept today. You say, well, why is that? You know, they're consenting adults. They're doing whatever they want to do. You know, they're not hurting anybody. All sin hurts people. All sin has, has these consequences and you hurt other people. You say, well, I understand divorce because you're hurting you know, your spouse. Even if it is consent, else, you're hurting some other people. You're hurting your family. You're hurting your children. But why, but why sodomy? Why is that? You know, who are you hurting? Because those sodomites are, are recruiting and trying to get other people into that lifestyle and, and they do it by preying on people. They are hurting other people. You just because just you don't know about it doesn't mean it's not happening. I had to explain this once to one guy. I was out and this is not a topic that I bring up. But when someone else brings it up to me, I'll, I'll try to explain it to the best of my ability. But there are things that people do. I said, there's probably things that you've done in your life that no one else knows that you've done. And no one else is even going to think that you've done those things. Why? You can present yourself a certain, however you want to people. You really can. I mean, you can do things in secret or in private that no one necessarily has. I mean, God knows everything. But to other people, I mean, even your close friends, you can be friends with somebody. Are you with them all the time? Do you know what they're doing all the time? I mean, is it, is it possible that maybe they might lie to you at some point to hide what they're doing? It's totally reasonable to believe that. So when we see from screen, the reason why I'm bringing all that up is because people will say, well, I know this person and they're not, you know, they don't do these things. You're not around them all the time. And the reason why I'm even saying all this stuff is because where is your author final authority lie? Is it even just with your experience and what you think? Or is it from God's word? So when we see the examples of the Sodomites in the Bible, like in Sodom, where, they, where all the, the Sodomites of the city gathered around the house and were, were pounding on Lot's door saying, hey, get those men out here that we might know them and that they were trying to violate them and that that's what they were doing. When we see Noah's son you know, defile him in the tent and abuse him. When we see these examples, and the example of the, of the sodomites with, with the man and his concubine that were traveling through and Benjamin, and they went and they, they, again, they did the same thing. They surrounded the house and he threw his concubine out to them and they, and they defiled her and forced her until she died. I mean, this, these are the examples of who the sodomites are in the Bible. These are the examples. And it's always a positive reference when the kings, when the certain kings came along that got the Sodomites out of the land. That was, a, that was a king that was doing right by God. When God rained fire and brimstone down and saying, look, there's none righteous, basically, but Lot. Lot was the only saved person there. None of those Sodomites were saved. There wasn't even five people that were saved in that city. And God decided not to send in an angel to preach the gospel. He decided to bring in angels to destroy it with fire and brimstone. This is the, the evidence and the truth that I need to understand that, you know what? There's more to it than what people are trying to make you believe about, about the sodomites. That you're, you're being brainwashed into thinking that it really isn't that bad. And it really is that bad. Let's bow our eyes in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the truth from your word. We thank you for um, 
Just laying everything out for us, dear God, I pray that you would please help us to have a proper attitude towards sin, towards all sin, dear Lord, especially these sins that are very grievous. Lord, I pray that you please help us to, to have that, that attitude so we can stay so far away from, from ever coming close to doing any of these wicked sins, dear Lord, and that you would um, bless this church, bless us with people who love you and want to serve you, help us to grow, dear Lord, help us to reach people that, that they could learn, excuse me, more about you and get the own sin out of their lives, dear Lord, and help us to be, um, use the proper love with people where we are forgiving, but at the same time, we have a standard set, dear Lord, that we don't have the, the, a little leaven that's going to leaven the whole lump here. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.